morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, welcome. So glad to see your faces streaming in from all across the country. And before we went live, Dr. Humanowitz and I were trying to figure out whereabouts in the US or the world everyone's tuning in from. So we'd love to have you type in the chat where you're joining us from today. Uh, so my name is Andrea Merriam, and I'm with the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance. I'm joining in from hot and sweaty uh, suburban Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. And we're so happy today to have as our Movement Disorder Neurologist guest, Dr. Neil Hermanowitz. Um, I think I see some, uh, some Californians, some Southern Californians out there. So some of you um, might know him, but he's a recent transplant. So um, welcome, Dr. Humanowitz. Why don't, while people are typing in where they're from, why don't you tell us where you're tuning in from? I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, northern New Mexico, where it's usually sunny. It's been a little bit overcast uh, lately. I look out my window and I see on one side there are clouds and the other side is blue sky, which is so typical of New Mexico. It can be raining on one side of the street and not the other. Lovely. And that's a recent move for you, right? How long have you been in New Mexico? It, it is. Uh, I was in Southern California in Orange County um, for over 20 years. And then I relocated to uh, Santa Fe in January of this year and started seeing patients here in March of this year. Okay, well, Santa Fe is a beautiful historic place. So Orange County isn't too bad either. So Orange County was, Orange County was wonderful. And I have to say, I, I, I think about my patients there and my professional contacts there on a daily basis. I miss them all, but it, it, it was, a, you know, the, the climate there is ideal and it was such, just a wonderful place to uh, develop my career and, uh, and also raise our two children. It was a, place that we enjoyed immensely. Well, we're glad that thanks to the power of technology, uh, we're all able to come together. We're physically distanced, but we're socially connected and excited to, to join here um, to learn about this topic. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about why you chose this topic? Um, I know there was a lot of flurry of activity um, both from our email notifications and social media. I think this topic resonated with people and we have quite a few uh, tuned in and some who will be watching the recording. So, um, you know, the, the gist that we talked about was, you know, why Parkinson's symptoms sometimes abruptly change. So is this something that you see in your clinic? And then I'll just let you take it from here and I'll, I'll zip it and let the expert talk. Uh, I do see it in my practice, have for years. And, you know, when I first uh, meet people who have this diagnosis, a uh, question that often comes up is, how will I be? What can I expect uh, going forward for my future? What is my prognosis? And I tell them that this is not something that, this diagnosis is not something that changes abruptly. It, it's uncommon when that occurs. However, in my, in my practice over the years, I have had many occasions where I get phone calls or communications from people come in for their appointment, and they are telling me that things have gone awry. Things are, have, have taken a step abruptly, either in, in motor uh, type uh, problems, mobility type problems, or sometimes in cognitive uh, type symptoms. And that's always, uh, to me, uh, an indication of something else going on. Uh, there have been several studies over the years about how does Parkinson's disease change over time. I've got a couple of, of these papers sitting here beside me. There have been a couple I'm aware of from uh, London, from uh, physicians there, movement sort of centers there. Another paper I have at my side from Singapore, which is published about six years ago, uh, talking about, well, how, how do people change as time goes by? And most of these papers have reach the same conclusion, which is initially people get better because they start on treatment, uh, whatever that treatment may be. It could be a combination of medication and exercise, perhaps exercise alone initially, but people get better. And then they uh, have a fairly steady course for some years uh, to get, uh, in the future. And how many years is, I suppose, uh, 
variable according to what study that you're reading and maybe from person to person, but on average, looking at groups of people, the, the change, uh, if there is any, is fairly small on an annual basis. So when I get a phone call from a patient or a care partner that things are not going well, it's to me a red flag that there's something else probably going on. It's not the acceleration of Parkinson's disease, it's something else. And then it becomes my, my challenge along with the patient and their care partner to try to figure out what that something else may be. Okay, well, I'm glad that uh, people do reach out with that phone call, whether it's the person with Parkinson's or the care partner from where we sit a lot of times, you know, in support groups or, um, you, know, uh, you know, where I'm not in my, not in a doctor's chair and not medical, we hear more, uh, you know, the, just the uncertainty, like, what if, uh, did, you know, what if, um, am I doing something wrong? What if I have another disease at the same time? What if, uh, you know, that, generic isn't what it claims to be. What if you just, there's so much uncertainty and we always recommend, you know, call the physician. Um, how long when people notice that, that symptoms have changed, you know, how long do you uh, want that to go on before your patients or their families call you? That's a good point because I will sometimes get a phone call in the morning uh, uh, somebody's having a problem and I'm seeing patients and I can't get back to them until the noon hour or later in the day. And I call them back and they go, oh, never mind, it's, it's, gone. it's gone, I'm better. So I think everybody who lives with or, or with somebody who has this diagnosis understands that there can be some days that are better than others and there can be some hours actually that are better than others. But if, if there's a persistence that goes on for days of a clear cut decline, either again in mobility or cognitive status that is of note to me and some alarm. And, you know, uh, mobility, I think is easier to assess. What would be some uh, non-motor, you know, um, signs that symptoms are changing? Well, non-motor non signs can be a wide variety of things, but the, the, the things I hear most, most commonly from patients or their care partners are uh, the appearance of hallucinations or acceleration of hallucinations. Uh, that is alarming to me, I have to say. Uh, or if somebody seems to be more confused uh, or confused at all when they were not before. If somebody seems to be inabil unable to communicate uh, adequately or understand uh, communication with their care partner. That's alarming to me. That would be a non-motor cognitive kind of problem. These are the things I've heard of from my patients over the years on several occasions. The appearance or acceleration of uh, so-called psychosis symptoms, either hallucinations or delusions, or difficulty just with confusion or communication, or level of alertness. Sometimes people uh, seem to be more somnolent, sleepy excessively uh, during the course of the day when they, you know, that's not rare in Parkinson's disease. But if that has become, well, I can't wake him up or I can't get her up uh, for hours at a stretch, and that's a change that gets my attention. Okay, so it's a persistent uh, change in symptoms. It's not just off time. It's been a number of days. Um, it could be, you know, mobility and motor or non-motor. Some of the most common being, you know, hallucinations, um, just change, all of the things that you just mentioned. So now, what as a clinician, what is your step? What do you then do? Well, I, I try, try to figure out what, what could be the problem. And one first place to start would be, has there been some change in medication? And also, or has there been some change in compliance? with medication, it's not rare that I hear from patients or the care partner that, well, I found the pills on the floor or I looked in their, in their pill dispenser box and uh, some were taken and some were not. So there's an issue of compliance. And this is, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to cast blame on the patient. Uh, sometimes when I look at the medication regimens that my patients are on, I, I wonder how, how do they do it? How do they keep up? It is not easy and part of my job as a uh, physician treating people with Parkinson's disease is to try to come up with 
a medication regimen that's reasonable, that helps with the symptoms that we're targeting, uh, minimizes uh, potential side effects, and quite frankly, is realistic uh, that people can continue with uh, uh, in a reasonable way on a daily basis. You know, I've heard stories, I remember years ago, there was a colleague of mine who was a fairly prominent person in the movement disorders circles, um, who was, you know, take a half a tablet then and a quarter tablet there, and how can people possibly keep up with that? It's just very difficult. Uh, so coming up with a regimen that's reasonable for people to comply with is a first start, and that's my responsibility as a uh, provider to try to come up with that. So I look at medication. So there are, has there been some change in the medication. And, and again, I, I remember as very well as an intern, I was doing my emergency room uh, rotation, and I was on call every other night uh, and sleep deprived every other night. We don't do that anymore. Uh, but in those days we did, and I was exposed to meningitis, and I was supposed to take an antibiotic three times a day uh, to try to prevent getting meningitis, which is a life-threatening illness. And because of my busy schedule and distraction with other things, I found that I was not able to comply with that. You need some help. You need to see, you know, did you take your pill or somebody else to assist, especially when somebody's on medication, not just for Parkinson's disease, but for their blood pressure, their cholesterol, maybe their thyroid, other things as well. So having assistance with that medication regimen, I think is really important. And also having somebody else to verify is with the medications taken as they were supposed to or not. Yeah, you know, I've seen some of the medication cases that are just so complex. I've seen some three-dimensional ones. So you, you know, you have your days of the week and then the times in another dimension. So I, I love that you're, you take into consideration, you know, feasibility. Feasibility is, is I mean, you, you can come up with anything you think. I mean, it's, some of these medication regimens I've seen look like a chemistry experiment or, uh, and our patients are not supposed to be a chemistry laboratory. This is supposed to be something that they can reasonably uh, follow. So there's several considerations, something as simple as possible, you know, not different doses of different stuff. Uh, many times on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday do this, and then the other days do that. Uh, that's just too complicated for, for anybody, uh, whether they have Parkinson's disease or not. So coming up with something simple, something that can be uh, hopefully, again, trying to address the symptoms that we're trying to make better without causing a, a lot of trouble in terms of side effects. And also uh, yeah, that is uh, feasible uh, financially uh, as well, that it, it's not going to break the bank uh, for anybody. Yeah, and I bet it's important for your patients to have that open conversation with you about, you know, their comfort level because they think you know maybe there's some families where they are just that you know uh, super organized live by the spreadsheet maybe some families could handle more complex and some know that they're busy and multitasking and you know uh, um, grandkids and their lives are just they need to be something that's a little bit more uh, simple so <laughs> Again, the, the, the arrival at a medication regimen is a discussion, it's a negotiation. It's not, it's not me as the uh, provider saying, here, do this. It's, I always have that conversation with my patients about, does that sound reasonable to you? Is this something that we can do moving forward? And also address their concerns. Everybody's on the internet reading about side effects of medication. And that's another open discussion about what can these medications do good, as well as what are the possible uh, problems that can arise and having a realistic appraisal of what uh, potential side effects may be. For those of you who aren't Dr. Hermanowitz's patient, I, I love that word, you know, negotiation, that it should be, you know, uh, be empowered, push back if it's not going to be something that, you know, is going to fit with your life. Right. And if people don't want to do it, they're not, <laughs> not going to do it anyhow. So yeah. it doesn't, you know, I can create any kind of uh, medication regimen that I suggest, and if it's not acceptable to the pa patient, uh, they're, they're not going to follow uh, doing that anyhow. Okay, so new medication, medication compliance or non-compliance, maybe we need a softer word for compliance. You know, it's a medical term, and it's, it's kind of archaic. It's, it's almost punitive in terms of it's the tone of it. You didn't comply. Uh, your credit card has been denied kind of thing. It, it just doesn't sound right. I don't like the term either, but it's just, a, I don't know what else to substitute for. 
at this point. But just, I mean, again, it's not intended to be uh, accusative in any way. It's, it's a recognition that this is hard for everybody to, to keep up with even a three times a day dosing uh, is, uh, is challenging for people. I've had, I don't have had people who ran big companies, uh, 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 masters of their universe and so forth, and said, I can't remember to take my second dose of the day. I've, never, I've heard it many times over the years. Yeah, well, nope. we had some um, some specific questions in the chat about um, what about motor skills changing abruptly and drastically over a few days? What about the sudden onset of festinating and falling? I don't know if you want to go, you know, each symptom, what if all of a sudden this changes? Or maybe you want to, if there's, I don't know, um, uh, an umbrella that you can, you know, put over a few of these categories? I, I do have some sort of general thoughts about why medication issues may contribute to an abrupt change. One would be, again, this compliance, for lack of a better word. Uh, the other thing is that, that sometimes occurs is that other well-meaning healthcare providers may tinker with the regimen. You know, a patient will see other doctors besides me or other providers besides me, and they may comment, well, I have this kind of symptom, and the provider well-meaning will say, well, stop that drug then, or do this instead. So if somebody's having a problem that's abrupt, I, I want to review all their medications. So sometimes the well-meaning providers will make adjustments to the Parkinson's regimen that I've suggested or put in place, which you know, really isn't their sphere of expertise, and perhaps they their, their, their intentions are good, uh, but the results may not be. So I want to make sure that other people aren't making changes or adding things that could be problematic. Uh, there are other medications that people, other providers could add for urinary symptoms, for example, or even for psychosis symptoms that can be problematic. Uh, I've had the experience of many times over the years of somebody's having urinary urgency and frequency, and they were sent to a urologist or another provider suggested they would take ditropan or oxybutin is the generic name for that, which has kind of become infamous for its nasty side effect profile. It, it works well in the bladder, uh, and but also gets very well into the brain and does not have a positive effect there. So I want to make sure there aren't other medications that are being added uh, that, that could be problematic in people with Parkinson's disease. Or if somebody is having, <clears throat> excuse me, a perceived side effect, uh, occasionally medications are withdrawn or added to address perceived uh, side effects, whether they're actual side effects or not. Uh, one has to be careful about that. For uh, you cite again the example of excessive daytime uh, sleepiness, which does occur, just happens in Parkinson's disease, not necessarily a medication side effect and a well-meaning a uh, primary care provider may say, well, stop your levodopa or reduce your levodopa. Uh, and that, uh, of course, can have an uh, abrupt uh, consequence and people can take a dive downward in terms of their mobility as a con consequence of that. So as, uh, you know, uh, from the patient side of things, I think it would be lovely if every physician that you saw, you know, knew Parkinson's and understood, but unfortunately that's not the case. So sh do you recommend that patients when they see, you know, whether it's a primary care or a urologist, you do, are, is there, you know, I, they can't obviously be expected to remember all these, you know, contraindications and whatnot, but do you, can they say, I have Parkinson's it's different or what do you, is there a, something that you advise? I advise them, um, if, if somebody's suggesting a change to their Parkinson's regimen, they contact me uh, and, and discuss it with me first. Or if they're adding a new medication, and this is not such a, a, a burden upon me, but if somebody wants to add a new medication, just check with me. Just leave a message in the office and say, am I, you know, Dr. Smith wants me to take, drug XYZ, is that okay? And quite often it's okay. And I'll just say, yes, that's okay. Uh, but I've on occasion had uh, examples of no, it's, it's not okay. And I can cite some of the horror stories that I've encountered over the years of where things were, were done uh, that were hugely problematic. Are there 
you know, do your horror stories have, um, you know, are there certain, I don't know, top three that people should be on the lookout for? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And everyone so, get out your notepad and I'll, you know, I'll, just, I'll just give you a, an anecdote about one of the, hor the sort of the infamous horror stories from one of my patients in the past. Nice fellow I'd known for years and he's having uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Not rare and a, a leading cause that people end up actually in the hospital with Parkinson's disease. One of the uh, top three or four causes and um, is, is admitted to the hospital not to a neurology uh, service, but to the internal medicine service. And they don't contact me until things really start really going badly. And then they sent me an email saying, oh, uh, your patient's here in the hospital and things are looking pretty grim. And I was actually on vacation when I got the email, but I got into the medical record and looked into what was going on. And because the patient was having some GI gastrointestinal type problems, um, not only did they stop his levodopa in, in the hospital, because thinking that it was a contributing factor which it not, was not, but also put him on a medication called metoclopramide or Reglan, R-E-G-L-A-N. If you have Parkinson's disease, <laughs> do not take that medication. It's a dopamine blocking medication. It's uh, used on a short-term basis for people who are having something bloating like gastroparesis, but it's bad news if you've got Parkinson's disease. It's something to avoid. There's a similar medication, the trade name is Compazine, which is an anti-nausea medication. Again, a dopamine blocking drug that, that people uh, should not take. Uh, I've had occasions where people have gone into the hospital to have their gallbladder removed, and it's not rare that, that uh, even people who are not having trouble with confusion at home or hallucinations at home, once they're in the hospital where, you know, you're in a strange place with strange people coming and going, somebody coming in at 11 o'clock at night to check your blood pressure and stuff like that. Symptoms sometimes emerge of confusion or agitation. Um, and occasionally people in the hospital will respond, not me and not necessarily a uh, neurologist, by prescribing a medication, an antipsychotic medication. Um, and most of them are, again, to be avoided if you've got Parkinson's disease because they cause worsening of uh, Parkinson's symptoms. So I've had, I think I saw a message come up on the screen, how about Risperidone? Well, that's a known offender. It's a dopamine blocking medication. It's not a good choice for agitation or hallucinations for somebody, whether they're in the hospital or at home. Uh, I've had examples of patients receiving haloperidol or hal. not likely to cause any kind of lasting detrimental effects, but it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh oh, are you hearing me okay? Because I got that flash again. Okay. Uh, it's haloperidol and similar antipsychotic medications are again, likely to aggravate symptoms of Parkinson's disease, worse in mobility issues, not help them. So those are uh, just a few examples of, of medications to avoid. Okay. And let's see. I know that the many are familiar with the Parkinson Foundation's Aware and Care Kit. I think that's an excellent resource for, you know, when, if you're hospitalized. Um, are you familiar with that? And do you recommend, um, you know, your patients have that? I am familiar. And I'm re I recommend that if at all possible, they have an advocate with them if they have to go in the hospital. Um, that they have somebody. So there, there, are, there are several things that can occur when people are in the hospital. And I have an example. One of the papers I pulled up was from the University of Florida. And my uh, colleague and friend, Mike Oaken, is one of the co-authors uh, co of that. And just showing uh, examples of what, what happens uh, to people that go into the hospital, missing dosages and neuroleptic usage may prolong length of stay in hospitalized Parkinson's disease patients. Um, and I don't think this is unique. I know it's not unique to the University of Florida where this paper came from, that people with Parkinson's disease go in the hospital often not for Parkinson's disease. Most often it's because of an infection problem, most often pneumonia or trauma, a fall and a fracture, for example, or as I mentioned, GI types of problems. They've got a partial bowel obstruction or a twist of their bowel, which is causing trouble. Um, happened to one of my patients just recently 
And then the, the medication regimen of whatever, levodopa or whatever medications they're on, is tinkered with. And the staff, no matter how many times they've had an in-service educational program about this, they, they don't quite understand that uh, a 7 a.m. dose of a medication is important. Uh, it's, it's important for many people, whether, whether it's 7 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. And that difference in time can be the difference of somebody's overall sense of well-being. And for some people with Parkinson's disease saying, I'm going to hold on to your medication dose for an hour is, is sort of like saying, well, I'm going to stand on your oxygen hose uh, for about an hour and see how you do. It can be quite awful for people. And in that paper, they also point out that, well, many of these doses are missed. They're not given on uh, according to schedule as they should be. And it's not uncommon that people get these antipsychotic medications, uh, uh, even though there's a contraindication uh, for this with people with Parkinson's disease. So it, it really does take somebody there at the bedside um, uh, to be an advocate for the patient because the patient themselves usually can't you know, say, well, what, what are you giving me now? What is it for? And, and so forth. Uh, they really need to have a care partner or somebody to be their advocate if they can all arrange it. It's really the optimal way. The optimal thing is don't go to the hospital, of course. Uh, it's not, it's all hospitals, I'm sorry to say. We, at my last job, we made efforts to use the computer uh, medical record to avoid those kind of medication mistakes, and they still happen. Okay. So Linda had a good point. She put, we left her hanging. So when a patient comes to you and they've had sudden changes, so you check for, um, and a couple, uh, we have a couple wordsmiths in the audience. They suggested the word adherence instead of medication compliance. So there you go. <laughs> so you check for medication adherence, medication adjustment, new medications, maybe from, you know, not from the neurologist. Any other steps? Well, yeah, I, I, if, if there doesn't seem to be any problem with the medications, and I'm thinking, what else could be going on? And that covers a lot of ground. And it could be something simple like a urinary tract infection or something not so simple like a fall with a, what's called a subdural hematoma. And that's where people have conked their head and they have some bleeding on top of their head, on top of their brain, inside the skull. Not, not, a, not necessarily a visible bump, at all, but there can be, as we get older, the space between our skulls and our brain enlarges somewhat, and there are so-called bridging veins that go between the top of the brain and the inside of the skull, and they're somewhat fragile. And if you shake your head hard enough or bump your head, uh, even without any kind of laceration or abrasion, you can have some bleeding inside underneath the skull on top of the brain. That happened to Ronald Reagan when he fell off his horse. Uh, he had a subdural hematoma. Uh, and that can cause abrupt worsening. And there's another, I was looking to see how often that turns up in people with Parkinson's disease. And I didn't see it published. It doesn't come up too often I, in, my, in my practice. In the past, I didn't often see it, but I did see it on occasion. So one's antenna need to be up if there's no other explanation about why somebody has abruptly declined. A CT scan may be in order, especially if there's a history of falling, even if they're not necessarily bad falls. Yeah, there was an example of a, a series of just four, four people who had subdural hematomas and the surgeons attributed their abrupt Parkinsonism to the, to the subdural hematoma. Supposedly these people did not have Parkinson's disease before and they had these subdural hematomas and when they were drained surgically, they returned to normal. But I think, I'm not sure that's correct, but I, 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 it could be. But at the same time, if somebody has Parkinson's disease, and they get a subdural hematoma that's not recognized, that could be a source of a, a rather dramatic decline. Okay. And does it, so you have your, you know, the, the checklist. Um, is it ever just the Parkinson's itself that? So rarely. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, in the, in the past, I, I was treating about a thousand or more people with Parkinson's disease, and I could count on one hand with fingers left over where it was Parkinson's disease taking a malignant turn. Uh, it's almost always provoked by something else. Um, and the something else could be something as simple as a bladder infection, as I mentioned. Another one that I think is often overlooked is constipation. Uh, although it's recognized that people with Parkinson's disease often have constipation and it can have an impact on 
on how medication is uh, working well or not. Uh, people will say, yes, I've had a bowel movement every other day, but it's an incomplete bowel movement. Bowel movement. On occasion, I have done x-rays of my patients when I can't, when I'm looking for what's going on, what's causing the trouble here. And I see that even though they say I've had a bowel movement, they're still full of stool that's evident on the x-ray. And that has to be addressed and has to sometimes be addressed kind of aggressively, including by an enema, uh, for example. And not rarely when that is a dealt with, then things can settle down and get back to close to normal. Okay. Um, Gil had a good question. What about stress? Is it ever, he mentioned maybe related to COVID-19, but yeah. in your, you know, uh, in your observation, does stress, could that trigger the abrupt symptom changes that we're talking about? Absolutely. And that's another thing that I query my uh, patients and their uh, care partner about. And I can cite an example of that. And I, uh, a patient of mine some years ago came in and said, I'm worse. Um, and and when, I, when I examine my patients, I usually record their motor score from the Unified Parkinson's Rating Scale. He said, I, I know my score is going to be worse today. And I said, what, what's going on? Well, he had a, a sudden death in the family that was unexpected and quite tragic. And he had the emotional, it just happened recently, and he had the emotional stress of, of losing a family member to an accident. Uh, and he was, he was right. When I did the uh, motor exam, his, his score was clearly worse. And then it had been the, at the last visit and his medications had not changed. And apparently there was nothing else going on. So it was the emotional stress. And when I examined him some time later, although the sadness uh, was still with him, the acuity of it had uh, diminished somewhat. His score uh, was closer to where it had been in the past. So stress of almost any kind, having surgery on your hip is stress, but, uh, but losing a loved one or some financial crisis or family issue, uh, that kind of stress can also exacerbate symptoms of Parkinson's disease acutely. I don't know how to avoid stress. Uh, and, and these are stressful times. I can't remember a time in my life that was as, you know, sort of as broadly stressful for the entire nation as it is right now. Um, you, you know, you're going to say, don't turn on the news, but it's almost hard not to do that. Um, but I think recognizing that and trying to cope with it in some fashion may help minimize the impact of, of stress. But stress, yeah, big factor. Okay. And is it when your patients come to you with a, a change in symptoms, is it no matter what the abrupt change is, um, you know, that you kind of uh, start into this checklist or is it are there certain types of symptoms that may trigger other things? We've had some specific questions about, you know, what if um, mobility falls and festinating all of a sudden get worse? Is that a sign of something specific or? No, no, okay. no, it's a nonspecific response. I mean, it could, it could be, as I said, emotional stress, or it could be a bladder infection, or it could be a subdural hematoma. One of our patients in the past, uh, uh, I was out of the office, but my colleague, my junior colleague was on her toes and, and did some lab studies because it was not apparent why he had had an abrupt decline. He was found to be an acute renal failure, even kidney failure, uh, which was uh, arising from a cancer that he was unaware that he had. So his cancer was detected. That's unusual. That's a really uh, uncommon story, but it just shows that almost anything whether it's something simple like a bladder infection. And by the way, people don't necessarily have foul smelling urine, nor do they have burning, nor do they have a change in their symptoms of urination, but they can still have a bladder infection that can be setting things off. Okay. Um, so two people, Deborah and Victoria, had a question that it's kind of the opposite. What about the sudden improvement of symptoms immediately upon introduction of a new medication or a tweak of existing meds? I've, I, I'm so pleased to hear that somebody else has noticed that because I have many times, and I just heard it uh, recently, in the, in the either last week or earlier this week, where somebody had, I had made a medication change and they came back to me and they said, for two days I felt like I didn't have Parkinson's disease, but then things seemed to go back. To where they were. And 
you want to say, well, that's you know, a placebo effect, which may be mediated by release of dopamine. The anticipation of things improving can have uh, a, a neurophysiological effect, can a biochemical effect. I'm not sure, but I've heard that many times. I've had, when I was working in California, a lot of Californians go to Hawaii for vacations. <clears throat> and I would hear from patients, oh, I was in Hawaii for two weeks and I felt like I didn't have Parkinson's disease until I came back to California. So the, just sort of the change of environment, the sort of the, the pleasure of being on vacation in a pleasant place seemed to uh, alleviate their symptoms in some fashion. I, I don't, I could, I could only speculate as to why that's occurring. Maybe more people should go to Hawaii. I don't <laughs> And I, growing up on the cold and snowy East Coast, I always thought that was not fair. You already live in California, and then you go on vacation to Hawaii. Come on. It took me a while to understand it when I moved to California. This, isn't this Hawaii? But it's not the same. I understand now why people go there. <laughs> yes, it's right there. It's right next door. Um, let's see. So I will mention... Um, we also, on this program, we like to take advantage of, you know, the, the interactive capability of Zoom. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question directly on camera, um, it's always nice to, I get sick of hearing my own voice, it's always nice to hear um, another voice. So in order to do that, just give us a little wave. You are allowed to unmute yourself. Um, and you can unmute yourself and then just kind of listen for cues. Oh, I think I heard someone take me up on the offer right away. Okay, no, I think maybe it was an accidental auto mute. So, um, okay, so we'll be on the lookout for people wanting to ask a question. Um, I'll be listening for uh, um, people chiming in or you can you know wave your hand and um my colleague Rebecca there it has the the eagle eyes so um let's see let me make sure there was a Jane Thomas mentioned that she actually lists meds like Reglan Compazine, Haldol etc as allergies when her husband has to go into the hospital um, just as a way to really, you know, ensure that her wishes are taking, taken seriously. Um, I don't know if that's... That's, that's a good here. thing. We did that in the past as well uh, and would put that into the computer that it would flash red, you know, if somebody tried to prescribe one of those medications and we also listed those as allergies in the outpatient side. Okay. Like okay. it, Jane, way to be proactive. Yep. Um, and Clara, were you waving that you wanted to ask a question? Well, I was, and somebody else probably just asked my question on the chat as well. But um, so my husband has um, PD, and um, we came late, so I'm not sure what the the overwhelming sort of summary is of why it happens abruptly. I mean, he's recently been having more um, freezing episodes. Especially um, at night, in the evenings. So it's, it's been quite extreme and very unexpected since I'm taking my carbidopa, levodopa, and um, Ritary. Ritary and uh, trihexophenolphenol <coughs> um, and so forth. So but it's just been like falling off the table. Not literally, I'm not falling off the table. But <laughs> the <laughs> suddenness of the freezing has been very disconcerting. And last night, during the night, I was so stiff that I could not get out of bed uh, without aid from uh, my darling wife, which was also a new thing, which I really don't want, really don't hope to uh, repeat. So uh, I don't know if the, if the suggestion we heard about Hawaii, I mean, that might be a nice solution, but um, that's, we live in New Jersey, so that's not happening right away anytime. So any other suggestion short of a trip to Hawaii would be helpful. Right. And I'll just make sure, um, you know, Dr. Hermanowitz, I'll put down that disclaimer. You know, he's not reading your chart. So if you could, in broad strokes, address that question. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, I can't give specific device, advice about uh, a patient who's not under my care. But if I were to hear that from one of my patients, I would think about some of the things we discussed. 
is constipation a problem? Is there accumulation of stool now a problem? Um, and uh, if somebody told me they were taking trihexaphenidyl, which is an anticholinergic medication, Artane, uh, has a very well-known potential side effect of constipation, I would be wondering about that as something that could be a contributing factor. Even when people tell me that, well, I've had a bowel movement uh, daily or every other day, I would still be suspicious. And again, I'm not providing individual advice, but I would still be suspicious if there's something else going on. There's been no change in the medication regimen. Something is provoking this and I would be constipation or stool accumulation behind my list. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Deborah, I think is up next. Deborah Hockman and yes. go Thank for you. it. Deborah. Hi. Um, so I'm asking uh, a question regarding my husband who was diagnosed in uh, 2012. And basically it's one of these diagnoses that whoever we go to has a different take on it. In short, he's atypical um, and he presents to me as if he has Lewy body. So picture somebody with Lewy body symptoms, but the cognitive hit wasn't diagnosed within the year of the Parkinson's. So one of the reasons this, um, topic today really interested me is consistently from the minute he was diagnosed he's had symptoms that appear or surface and they'll be for a while and then they'll go subterranean and disappear sometimes for years and then later on return years later and so there's constantly ebb and flow um and i'm trying to keep him off you know medication for something or or some serious treatment for something that may then go subterranean for another year or years. Yeah. But does, have you ever witnessed that in your practice that you can have somebody whose symptoms are constantly changing, not only day to day or week, within a day to day mm -hmm. or week to week, but literally a, a symptom may appear for three months and then disappear for years and then return? Personally, I have not heard that commonly, okay. perhaps with the exception of uh, labile blood pressure, blood pressure that fluctuates a lot. No, and that's, I'm talking about even like the initial symptom was he had arm pain, shoulder pain. Mm. And that was the first symptom that ever appeared. And he had REM sleep disorder before he was diagnosed. And both of those dropped out for years and then surfaced later. So it's just, those are just two easy ones to pinpoint <clears throat> when you think it's not bladder, you know, UTI, or it's not, you know, medication because he wasn't on anything. But I could point to lots of symptoms. Um, well, some, <laughs> some of the things you mentioned, specifically the REM sleep behavior disorder and, and the arm pain, those are things that can wax and wane. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not necessarily there permanently. And I've heard that many times, especially specifically for REM sleep behavior disorder. Oh, yes, he or she used to do that all the time, but no, not so much. And I don't, I don't have an explanation for why that, you know, unless somebody started taking melatonin or clonazepam, which can treat that uh, symptom or perhaps uh, other medications, um, unless it's being addressed. But I don't think we really understand why those kinds of things kind of come and go as they do. Okay. And it doesn't, in your mind, suggest any specific diagnosis versus some other when someone's no, no, I, you know, I, I again, in your, you, you were sort of commenting about Lewy body. Well, everybody with Parkinson's presumably has Lewy bodies because that's the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease. I think you're meaning more diffuse spread of that Lewy body pathology, which can cause cognitive right. uh, problems. Many people who work in my field. And this, I, I get pushback all the time, especially from psychiatrists about this, think that they're one and the same, that they're not really different. Because as you pointed out, there's sort of artificial distinctions. A year, what if, you, what if your cognitive decline symptoms or uh, hallucinations start on day 366? Right. Uh, right. Do, you, do, you, do you use something different? So I, see, I think there's still a dilemma about separating those things, whether they're separable or not, and not everybody agrees about that. But in terms of the coming and going of some of these things, yeah, I hear that with some frequency. I have pain, no, I don't, or I've had REM sleep behavior disorder. No, She's telling me all the okay. And I think we had, uh, so we're gonna go and order Kathy, and then Fran, and then Jim Atard. So Kathy, if you, I see you raising your hand there, you look like you're in a, Florida room, maybe. 
Um, if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh, and now you're muted, Kathy's iPad. Okay, Kathy. Right. Oh, there you go, Kathy. Go for it. I've, I've, uh, too, have had a sudden onset of uh, freezing since the beginning of COVID. Could that be because I'm confined and not socializing much? Yes. And depression? Yes, it could be. I, I think that is a form of stress. I find it stressful. I don't have Parkinson's disease, but I, I find this, this isolation. My wife and I have talked about this on several occasions, how this has really had an impact on all of us. It's harder, I think, on people who are already coping with something like Parkinson's disease to have this sort of, I've heard it many times from my patients here, that they're not getting out and meeting with people. And we know, I've told people throughout my career that the, the, the optimal treatment of Parkinson's disease is judicious use of medication, regular exercise, <clears throat> social connection, and intellectual uh, activity as well. And if you take away one of those components, people I don't think are gonna do as well. The science behind that is sort of lacking. The evidence for that is not entirely clear, but I just observed it in my, in my experience over the past 30 years uh, practicing in, in movement disorders that people who are becoming socially aloof don't seem to do as well. Can, um, can it reverse once we start getting active? Because I'm, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start socializing because I have a lot of friends and I have, I've been very, very good. I'm going to start playing cards and everything else with them now. Because can it reverse itself? Because I went from pretty good to almost in, incapable. I shouldn't even probably be living by myself at this point. Yeah. Yes, it can reverse itself. Um, I, I I don't think it's a, a foregone conclusion that you can't regain that ground. And it's just like people who've had otherwise setbacks, whether it's constipation or social isolation or a bladder infection. Uh, I think once that exacerbating factor is addressed, people can get back to close or where they were before. I'll, I'll add that it doesn't always come back quickly and, and people have to be patient and, and, and try not to become over, overly frustrated with the slow process. It's just like going in the hospital for two days. If you're in a hospital bed, and, and who, where do they put you except in bed when you go in the hospital? Bed rest is a, is a terrible torment for people with Parkinson's disease. The two days of hospitalization, being in bed, will decondition people. It can take weeks or even longer to get back to where they were, but they ultimately usually do get back. Okay, good advice to be patient when you do uh, add that socialization. And I think next up, Fran um, Oprachuk had a question. Well, there's a familiar name, uh, we know each other. He's my doctor. 19 years of my doctor. A long time we've known him. Well, yes, a long time. I had a fit when he left. But now he does, it's like I'm going to talk to him later today. So he's not that far after all. I'm in San Diego, by the way, enjoying the beach. And the, uh, they go out at one of those, uh, um, we call them wheel, wheelbarrows, uh, wheelchairs, but they go in the sand. Okay. So if I can, I'm going to walk what I can walk and sit what I can sit and have my grandchild sit next to me. That's what I'm going to try this weekend. But the things he, there's one thing that I really have to emphasize and I won't take up too much time, teamwork. You've got to have a team. And he alluded to it in different ways. The doctor you have, if you, do, if you don't see that consistently or you don't get the interest that you need, you need to change because there's just too much at stake. And when you call, they, they know enough behind you or you could do what you need to do. But my friends, I've got two friends. If one comes out from Montreal, they're with me all the time. They watch my back and they never try to do things for me. They think I can do for myself. And freezing is what I'm frightened to death of. And that's what's happening to me right now. And I, I don't know what to do. And so I've, I've held all people, okay, stop, take a step. So that's up over the line, different things. But at that particular time, everything gets scary, everything. And so that's why I'm seeing him today. Did you go to have some time for him? And he's long distance, but I can't let him go. He has to stay part of my team. Well, I can that's see all. why. And um, I would, uh, yes, I'm glad that, yeah, with telemed, you know, you, you two can. Yeah. Still connect and and Dr. Romanowitz, any you know um, comments on Fran's comments about the freezing that you know kind of are general beyond her specific case? 
Well, I, I think her, uh, just back up a little bit, her comment about teamwork is really important. I mean, this is, we don't have a cure yet. Uh, I do hope uh, one day there will be, there are interesting studies that are underway right now. Uh, but this does require a team, a dedicated team of people. And I know I met a uh, friend from Montreal at one of her last visits in Southern California. Good to have people who are supportive. It's such a, it's such a tough road unless you've got a, a you know a team on your behalf at least a supportive uh, care provider if not more people and, and it should include your physician or your care provider as well okay and so uh the attards have been patiently i see you don't look like a gym mrs attard and i'm probably pronouncing that wrong but you're also on mute could you unmute yourself and then after you we're going to go to deborah Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so when the um, doctor mentioned Ditropan, that raised a, a red flag for us. Um, Jim's been taking Ditropan for, I don't know, three or four years. And um, his cognitive issues have definitely gotten worse, you know, over this time. And Dr. Manowitz, you mentioned that uh, Ditropan can contribute to that. Um, as it so happens, we have an appointment with his urologist on Monday, so it might be a good time to perhaps make a change. Um, do you have any suggestions? Well, again, I can give, since I don't know you, you're not my patient, <clears throat> I'll just speak in general terms. Right. Uh, um, my experience with that medication has not been good in my patient population, and I discourage my patients from using that medication specifically. And it's often not the choice of the urologist, it's the choice of the insurance company, unfortunately. But I would, I would struggle against that. A similar medication, which has a similar mechanism of action, is called Trospium, T-R-O-S-P-I-U-M, which does not get into the brain as Ditropan does. That's one. Okay. There's a, another medication which urologists have been using, but there's still a lot of insurance pushback, unfortunately, called Merbetric, or Mirabegron is the generic name. Merbetric works by... Can you spell that one, please? M-Y-R-B-E-T-R-I-Q, and your urologist will surely know about that. And I don't want to tell them what to do, of course, or tell you what to do, because you're not under my care. But that's, a, med you. that's a medication... Can I interrupt? Can I interrupt? Yep. Yeah, hi, I, I have Parkinson's and I've been taking, I think it's called autofuzon. For, uh, autofuzon, yeah. Yeah, for your, urological problems I have, and like going to the bathroom too many times at night and stuff like that. And I've had no side effects from it and it's been effective in terms of uh, urology. D different class of medication. It's not yeah. Yeah. And it's inexpensive too. Yeah. So it depends on, what, depends on what the problem is that the urologist is addressing. There are several things that can contribute to urinary urgency and frequency. Uh, women, for example, don't have a prostate uh, and therefore don't have that as a component to their urinary symptoms with Parkinson's disease. So the, the mechanism of action it differs according to which problem you're trying to address with the bladder function. Right. And so for us, it's just basically, um, you know, that, that sudden uncontrollable urge and, uh, you know, incontinence uh, in that way. So that's what we're trying to correct. Yeah, very, very problematic. Uh, it's, it's off of the top of the night. And Deborah, you're muted. Yeah, Deborah, you're muted. Okay. Well, good luck with your urologist appointment. And we have next up um, Deborah. Um, who's been patiently, and Deborah, right now you're muted, but if you unmute and then you can go ahead with your question. And speaking in generalization terms, what is your course of action for constipation? Well, I try to prevent it in the first place, and I, I've tried everything under the sun uh, since I started doing this. And I've settled on that what is seemingly most reliable is polyethylene glycol, which goes by the trade name of Miralax. But, but taking it when you are constipated is usually not effective. Uh, people have to take it, in my experience, on a daily or every other day basis uh, to try to prevent the stool accumulation. 
polyethylene glycol sounds like antifreeze, which it is. It's a antifreeze for the gut. It's a sugar your body doesn't absorb. It acts as a stool softener and also as a propellant. When this is, I'm not, again, I'm, this is, I'm just talking generally, not specifically to you. Right. But if, if somebody is having problems with constipation, which comes up all the time, I start with the polyethylene glycol, which used to be prescription, and now you can get it you know, over the counter anywhere, uh, probably in the grocery store. And if that alone is not working, I usually have people add milk of magnesia, a couple of tablespoons at bedtime, and that will usually take care of it. Not always. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And um, next up, and it is going to be our uh, last question, is uh, Michael Stepniak. So if you could go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Um, Michael, are you out there? Yes. Well, that's is actually Michael's wife, Joe, and I'm the one who has oh. Parkinson's. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, um, I understand, doctor, what... Um, that constipation can um, inhibit absorption of levodopa. I'm wondering what, um, in addition to protein, what other things can also limit the absorption of levodopa? Well, they used to say B6, uh, but, but not really an issue, I don't think, as long as you're taking carbidopa. Uh, and you mentioned protein, which does come up. It's, you know, that's been a discussion for 20 years or more. Uh, about how it can have an impact on uh, the efficiency of absorbing levodopa. But quite frankly, any food uh, can slow down and, and delay and perhaps reduce the absorption of, of your medication. So not just levodopa, can do it with other, you know, primopexol or dopamine agonists, for example. Um, I think people have to figure out on an individual basis how much impact that actually has upon them. Uh, I've had patients who recently, somebody here was having uh, omelet and a protein shake at breakfast, which was probably not a good idea to start the day, with, especially with their levodopa. But I, I also will say that I think the, and I've heard it a lot, especially here in Santa Fe, but I think the protein discussion may be overstated and can be for, for many people and can make people's lives more complicated than they need to be because I hear people, you know, patients occasionally almost in tears how can I, I've eaten my, my lunch, I had my turkey sandwich, now I can't take my pill, or I've taken my pill and now I can't eat my turkey sandwich. And for most people in my experience, except for that first meal of the day, uh, that's, that is not worth the anguish of, of when I eat, when I take my levodopa. I, I, unless I'm hearing otherwise from patients specifically, I, I don't usually make a big, big deal about sequestering the medication from their meals or from levodopa or from protein, rather. Is there anything no, else that could limit it, um, absorption? Limit, limit the absorption besides protein and B6. I can't, I can't think of anything uh, off the top of my head. Um, there were a couple of questions about the heat wave affecting symptoms. Could dehydration maybe? Uh... Yes, and, but I've, I've heard the extremes of temperatures. So before I, I worked in, in sunny, warm Southern California, I was briefly in the Midwest, Chicago. And, and I, what I would hear from my patients in Chicago, in the suburbs, was that uh, when it got, you know, th Chicago February would exacerbate symptoms uh, of all types. Mobility would decline, tremor would increase. And in California, which is, you know, in Irvine, it's usually 76 degrees, but occasionally there'd be a heat wave and my patients would complain bitterly about the extremes of temperature. And I also had an outreach clinic in a community in the desert in the Palm Springs area, Rancho Mirage, where you know, it's routinely in the summertime over 100 degrees. And that was very hard on my patients. So yes, uh, dehydration and also just the extremes of temperature, which I think are another form of stress and by the way, somebody asked, is Tamsulosin okay? Yes, it is. Flomax is okay. Okay. So we can never squeeze in all of the questions. Thank you for, for being patient. And the good news is we do have almost daily educational program going on um, on NeuroLife Online. So more chances for you to uh, ask questions and learn. Um, but Dr. Hermanowitz, in closing, 
could you leave us with a beautiful summary kind of of this, you know, when PD symptoms abruptly change, like what do you want to leave our audience with? Um, we discussed many different, you know, angles and avenues, but I would love it if you just put your, you know, well, a nice uh, bow on it. Some, some simple ideas. Uh, one, adherence. Uh, uh, two, is constipation a, an issue, even with bowel movements occurring, could there still be accumulated stool? Uh, and also other medications that could be problematic. And we talked specifically about ditropan or oxybutynin. So I would review the medication list, think about adherence, think about simple things, uh, you know, the things like subdural hematomas and undetected cancer, those are rare. Uh, but I would think about the simple things first, like a stool accumulation or a bladder infection. And talk to your doctor, be open, make it a, you know, not a one way, you know, uh, um, conversation from the doctor to you, but a two way. And I know you do that so naturally with your patients, Dr. Hermanowitz, but I think it goes, it can never be said enough uh, because not everyone can come to Santa Fe and see you, unfortunately. Well, it's a nice place, but these days it's hard to travel. <laughs> oh, right. Well, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. Always appreciated. And thank you to everyone who joined. Um, you guys had some great questions. And we always like to end these sessions um, with a wave of gratitude and connection. So uh, I invite you to turn your cameras on and show Dr. Hermanowitz you know, our appreciation and how much we learned and how much we uh, enjoyed spending this time together. Um, and we hope to see you again on another NeuroLife online program soon. Thank you all. Bye Thank now. You. Bye now. Brand, see you later. <laughs>